the most powerful being, which is Lucifer, other than, you know, Christ and God himself, is able to copy and masquerade family members and loved ones and things like that and make them seem like they're coming back and speaking to you. We have AI that does a pretty good job of that now. Yeah. That can copy people. I have a great Pope Francis clip where he's like, don't think you can go to Jesus alone, uh, along with Sunday sacredness, this immortality of the soul issue, and we're going to like dive in and define what that is, is really going to be the two, the, the left and the right arm of the, the main deception that's coming. And hopefully, even if people don't believe what we're saying, the uh, idea is to go in your Bibles and go compare scripture with scripture. So here come the daughters in that window. The yeah. mother receives her wound right as America becomes a, a, a world power. And inside of that world power, all the daughters spring up with scripture and go challenge what your pastor or your Bible study teacher or whoever is saying, if it's different than what we're presenting here, because we're going to present Bible evidence. Welcome everyone to another Truth Matters episode. And I'm here again with Matt Shanshe. Hey Mackenzie. We are glad to have everybody back. We just got done with some of Robert Breaker's videos and doing a little bit of a study and comparison on those. Matt, do you want to explain kind of where we just were and where we're going now? Yeah, I, I think what we've tackled pretty thoroughly now, going back to the first Sunday episode, is like where Sunday came from, what it's morphed into, why it's important, and even gone and said, okay, let's look at what others say about this and put it side by side to show that the first day, seventh day issue is a legitimate one, uh, that the uh, we hopefully corrected a lot of common uh, errors people have about mm -hmm. Adventists and what they believe in the last couple episodes, but... Uh, for people who think that the Sabbath is the only thing that we think is is going to be the issue here, maybe these next couple episodes or this episode specifically, and maybe some future ones down the line, we'll look at that second component of what we think is going to be really the main key of the deception that we're going to see. Yeah. So we, we say Sunday sacredness, and the second one is we're going to be looking at today uh, the state of the dead or the immortality of the soul, this doctrine yes. that like the soul, even if it's something bad that happens, the soul after you die, it still remains in existence and it kind of goes on forever. We're going to tackle these things because uh, along with Sunday sacredness, uh, this immortality of the soul issue, and we're going to like dive in and define what that is, is really going to be the two, the the left and the right arm of the, the main deception that's coming. And hopefully, even if people don't believe what we're saying, the uh, idea is to go in your Bibles and go compare scripture with scripture and go challenge what your pastor or your Bible study teacher or whoever is saying, if it's different than what we're presenting here, because we're going to present Bible evidence and just to start, this is just that we're just opening the door. Yeah. Kind of like with the blockchain stuff, we did two episodes and we kind of laid the foundation. So later when we look at Elon Musk and the Jesuits and all this, we can go refer back to it. We're doing the same thing here. This is like we're opening the door. So this is not going to be the full comprehensive end. It's going to be the beginning of something as, as looking at this yeah. immortality of the soul issue and how it relates to this final deception and how it kind of brings everyone under one banner, which is ultimately what the Bible says. There will be the whole world and then there will be this small remnant that the world hates and it will be based on these two final errors. And that plays in very strongly to the final events that people maybe don't realize it does because depending on your view of the state of the dead, whether, you know, the soul is a, a almost like a separate entity from the body that it goes to heaven or, or whatever, this will change the course of events and how we look at the things that are going to happen in the future. Because we know for a fact that Jesus says, don't be deceived. And he talks about all the signs of his coming. And this one plays very strongly into that. Yeah. So we're calling this defending the doctrine. <clears throat> And oddly enough, there was a, a great quote that I thought summed up exactly what we're defending here today. And I want to point out before we read this, that this is actually not an Adventist thing. Once again, this is a, a Protestant thing that has been forgotten. Yeah. And here's a perfect example of that. It says the martyr William Tyndall 
defending the doctrine that the dead sleep, so specifically the doctrine that he was defending was that the dead are asleep, declared to his papist opponents, and for people maybe who aren't familiar with this, Tyndall's like for life and death going up against the Catholic yeah. Church during the Protestant Reformation. If people are not familiar with that, go watch Darkness Before Dawn or any number of the Countering the Reformation. Yeah. Uh, all of these wonderful documentaries are rekindling the Reformation, excuse me, not Countering the Reformation. With these wonderful series we have covering this stuff because this was not just like a casual debate. Like yeah. they were fearing for their lives, these Protestant reformers. And here he's declaring to the papist opponents, ye in putting them, the departed souls, in heaven, hell, and purgatory, destroy the argument wherewith Christ and Paul prove the resurrection. If the souls should be in heaven, tell me, why would they be not in as good a case as the angels be? And then what cause is there of the resurrection? Mm -hmm. And so essentially what he's saying here is like, if the angels are considered in this perfect blissful state, perfect obedience with God, having never fallen from grace, like why would humans leave that to come back into the resurrection? And either some Christians haven't really thought about that point or some actually say they leave this heavenly bliss to go back into their dead bodies to be raised again. And we're going to look at that down the line and see why that's not really what the Bible teaches. Yes. And before we continue on, I just want to, since we're going into a very Bible-heavy topic, we're going to open with a prayer. Right. Father in heaven, um, Lord, we know we can do nothing without you. We know we can do nothing without your son. Lord, we are all just little children and sinners here, and um, we are just seeking to expound upon what you have said from the beginning. Uh, Lord, that you would show that these are not our principles, but yours, and that this is not us against anybody, but us with everyone trying to help show them the truth and that your truth may stand any test of scrutiny. And that's what we seek to do here today, Lord, is uplift your truth, that others might see it, believe it, and follow it with a loving Christ-like character that we hope to share with people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The idea that what's the point of the resurrection if everybody's already um, happily in heaven is, a, is something that was defended during the Protestant Reformation by a non-Adventist. So this yeah. idea that the dead are asleep is uh, originally a Protestant doctrine. So we see here in Great Controversy, page 547, it continues and says, And said Paul, if the dead raise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If for 4,000 years the righteous had gone directly to heaven at death, how could Paul have said that if there is no resurrection, they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished? No resurrection would be necessary. And what's the key term that Paul uses to describe the dead here? The asleep. They're asleep. They're, They're asleep. asleep. And so we're going to see this, this continuing theme and how this theme is actually distinguishing between... Uh, well, we'll see what is distinguishing between here soon. There's a, a lot of people that in the Christian world that just want to have like a, a casual non-doctrinal experience with Christ that it's, and in a way I can appreciate that, that you, you want to just be in that fellowship, supporting, loving, helping other people. And that's part of that Christian walk. But it, I don't think a true Christian walk can be done without having an understanding of some doctrine. And part of that is because Christ has said in the end that deception is the, the main key. And yes. it's actually doctrine that's going to be how they go about seducing. And it says here in 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time, so speaking towards the end of time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So the doctrines of devils can only creep in if your doctrines of God aren't strong and sound and solid. Right. And they're seducing. So you see the spirits, they're not forcing, they seduce. And so it's going to be something looks that's... good. It sounds good. It looks good. It tastes good. It, whatever yeah. it is, it's going to be sed seductive <clears throat> and deceptive. And that, to me... Uh, means that on some level, even a casual Christian should have a good foundation on certain Bible principles and the immortality yeah. of the soul is one of them. And that, and this is a really important point because we have to understand the doctrine and uh, to emphasize that even more, like you said, it looks good, it tastes good, it whatever. Eve, when she was told not to eat the fruit in the Garden of Eden, she looked and she said, hmm, it looks good for food. 
So it looked good. It was, you know, not that much different than all the other fruit that seemed like it was around. But it's those little details that when we don't catch them and when we don't understand them, they can lead you into a very wrong path. And we, we see the result of that. So here, these seducing spirits, which is just like the devil seduced in the Garden of Eden and doctrine of devils, it was a doctrine of the devil. Mm -hmm. And uh, this brings us right to that initial lie that he gave in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. And it's a great example, uh, too, because if Eve had known her doctrine, when he first asked the question, he said, should you, uh, even if you touch it, if you eat it, should you die? And that's not exactly what God said. That's not, yep. And so, but she thought basically that's what he said. <laughs> and that proves, I think, right from the very beginning that a base understanding of doctrine and being rooted in it, not being able to be moved, being like, hey, you said part of that was true, but the other half actually wasn't true. And I don't, I don't trust that because it's not in alignment with God's word. You know, the funny thing is about that, that Eve is the one who made the misdoctrine and the devil just used that. So Eve's, the devil said, what did God tell you? And she was the one who volunteered, don't eat or touch. She added or touch. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, well, I'm touching it and it's fine. Yeah. So he seen that she wasn't listening to every letter that was said by God. And he was able to grab a hold of that. So when we don't, we don't understand every single word that Christ is saying, then the devil will grab a hold of those things and use that against us because she said it and he just volunteered back the information to confirm, oh, is this what God said? And she's like, well, yes, that's what I just said, right? And it just went from there. And it's very seducing. It's, it's very, very seducing. seductive. It's very cunning. The devil has not changed his stripes. He is working the same. So like we've talked about, we got Klaus Schwab over your shoulder here, but like he's a front man, like a PR bad guy yeah. for uh, the movement that's really happening. And sometimes when we're dealing with this, we got to watch out for the good guys, the yeah. beautiful fruit hanging on the tree. But God said, watch out for that. It's bad. Even though yeah. it looks like it's coming in my name, I know them not, yeah. that kind of thing. So uh, even the casual person has room to be strong on core doctrine. Uh, so just as others with core doctrine need to be strong in loving, active faith yeah. that is shown not in doctrinal and in, in like intellectual understanding, but, but living faith and serving others in the name of Christ. And we're sharing a lot of great controversy today. No, it's an Adventist source, but there's been so many people whose lives have been changed just by reading the book from a historical understanding and context. Uh, I think we put it forward boldly as a means to say, hey, this is what we believe. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying everybody else has to believe it, but we're sharing it as not saying, hey, we want to show you the logic flow of why we believe this yeah. and how we make these connections. And then hopefully people will take the time for themselves. There's been enough, uh, I could almost say, misinformation about what we believe. So we might as well just tell you what we believe and then you can take it or leave it. Yeah, and you can put it up against other worldviews and and see if which one, you know, converses most with the Bible, harmonizes yeah. most with the Bible. And when I did that, I found that Seventh-day Adventist Ellen White doctrine blew every other doctrine I've read out of the water. So she says here in Great Controversy 552, he, Satan, has the power, and we we did a whole bunch of episodes on this. So if you want details about all these dead people coming back in yep. this miracle, demon-filled world, go watch all of our episodes on America. There's about five of them that we do where yep. we just go in great detail on all this stuff. So we're not going to dive into dead people coming back to life or what seem like yes. dead people coming back to life today. We're just going to touch on that this is what she, when, when you look at that verse, seducing spirits and doctrine is of devils. This is what she correlates with this. This is the time when Satan's bringing uh, before men the appearance of their departed friends. The counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tones are reproduced with marvelous distinctness. Many are comforted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven and without suspicion of, or danger of danger, they give ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And that's what's going to happen when these miracles start to happen in America, in the Protestant churches, most likely through the evangelical power, you're going to see people be swept away by this and they're going to throw their Bibles out the windows because they think that they're witnessing something divine. Yeah. And if it speaks not according to this word, it's because why? Because there's no, there's light. no light in them. So it doesn't matter if it looks like they're a loved one come back to life in the name of Jesus with yeah. all this heavenly 
surrounding angels are, if they speak not according to the yeah. word. And that's one of those Bible principles that if you're, even if you don't know much, know that. Know that if it speaks not according to the Bible, then it's not good. I mean, it shouldn't be that far-fetched for us to even think that the most powerful being, which is Lucifer, other than, you know, Christ and God himself, um, is able to copy and masquerade family members and loved ones and things like that and make them seem like they're coming back and speaking to you. We have AI that does a pretty good job of that now Yeah, that can copy people. So him with all of his intelligence and abilities, I think is not a stretch. No, it's not. And, and I think uh, people uh, underestimate uh, the level of infiltration uh, Satan has gotten into the world today in every aspect of life, music, television, politics, financial, like it's so widespread yeah. uh, that if you're not, if you're not conversant with your Bible, like it says, if it were possible to deceive even the very elect, this whole thing comes down to the immortality of the soul. And we want to make the distinction that there is a conditional <coughs> immortality of the soul and unconditional immortality of the soul. And the dangerous one that we're talking about is the one which unconditional immortality of the soul. Yeah. And this includes, includes the doctrine of hell being an eternal burning place. Because when you really think about that, uh, it becomes uh, immortality, even though you're there. Yes. And so I You're don't, eternally burning. You're eternally burning. Again, this is probably not the place to do the character of God discussion and the whole breakdown of what that, why that's not in harmony with God's character. What we see is that a lot of Christian groups are accepting the idea of an eternal hellfire without realizing that it is the original serpent lie, yeah. even though it's wrapped up in this punishment that looks like it's backed by Bible verbiage. This is why really understanding what it's saying in the context and, and spending time digging through like for buried treasure is because you can pretty much make the Bible say whatever you want. Yeah. That's why you have to go in there and it looks like on the surface... It, it is going on forever, and this is a place rather than an event. But what we see is at the end of it, if you push back all the window dressing, it's immortality of the soul. Yeah. And we want to compare that with what... Yeah, and I just want to emphasize there's two things to this, and that is whether it's conditional versus unconditional, but the second part is actually the soul itself, and we have to understand what the soul is because... Is it this separate part, this, you know, essence or of your being? Right. Because that's a really important part that's going to play into this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we ha we don't go into like the spirit plus body is soul into this one. But I know there's a lot of people out there who don't maybe understand. There's a Bible verse that says, uh, yes, the body turns to dust, but the spirit goes back to God. And this is how they justify yeah. that they go straight to heaven, not realizing that it's going back into God's possession, but that you're not, you will have a body in heaven. Uh, you will be spirit and body met together again. Yes. And that the spirit isn't actually something that can exist with our consciousness without the body aspect. It's just the breath. It's, it's just, just the, the nefesh, life. the breath. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, down the line as we, this, we're opening the door, that's yeah, yeah. maybe a few doors in to uh to this conversation but it's an important distinction that people maybe don't understand there is a conditional and an unconditional version of this immortality of the soul and it all goes back to the garden of eden genesis 2 17 but out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die genesis 3 verse 4 and the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die so there we go that immortality of the soul. Yeah. And it's pinning these two uh, powers against each other. Can these statements both be true at the same time? No. It's impossible. Uh, this is what is in my Christian coming to Christ journey. This is what maybe one of the most powerful moments that I had in realizing that all my new age stuff that I was into, all the I am my own God and everything's yeah. within and like uh, just thinking reincarnation and all this stuff. I didn't realize that by thinking that was true, I was backing Satan's original lie. Yeah. Even whether I believed it or cared, like this ancient book, regardless of if you believe it or not, it's the most ancient text and one of the most ancient texts mm -hmm. in human history, that I was 
following what the serpent said. And if this story were to be true, I had now backed the one power that is is the bad guy yeah. without even really realizing it. And it, it puts the, the, because they can't both be true at the same time, it makes one person here a liar. And I don't think people realize how severe, like this immortality of the soul yeah. thing is, because if you believe the serpent, you're calling God the liar in this situation. Yeah. And that is, I mean, you're free to make any choice you want, but that's like taking the biggest risk <laughs> of one's one's life. And for all these people out there, I witnessed to secular friends, and I, I've told them, bring me a worldview that doesn't fall into one of these two categories, and they can't do it. So no matter what, they're, you're either falling into one that's defined by God as true or one is defined by Satan that's true. And most of the world is falling under this, you shall not die. So even we can take this outside of Christianity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And this story of the serpent, right, who's speaking to the woman, when we look at all other kind of mystic religions, and they all have immortality of the soul as well, mm -hmm. and a lot of it is supported with the serpent, the serpent around the spine, mm -hmm. you know, we have all this, and they're glorifying the serpent, which in the Bible story, the serpent's the bad guy. Yeah. So it's a total... It's flipping it right on its head, which yeah. is why we feel that this is so important because it's one of the lies right from the beginning of the book, right to the end of the book. Yeah, and it and it pins again God God's statement against like yeah. a, a definitive. That's the enmity right there. Yeah, it is. Whose side are you on? Yeah, and in Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Taoism, all of these Eastern religions all fall under the immortality of the soul in, in some yeah. sh way, shape, or form. And then you look, we're going to dig more into where the, the Bible-based ones are on this. Oh, I just wanted to kind of read a few statements about where this came from, from Great Controversy. The doctrine of natural immortality first borrowed from the pagan philosophy and in the darkness of the great apostasy incorporated into the Christian faith has supplanted the truth so plainly taught in scriptures that the dead know not anything. And so it's basically this ancient, you, when you talk about the serpent, look at uh, Egypt and the role that the serpent played. So we, you go way, way back in this line of thinking. Yeah. And you see over time, as we've shown in previous episodes, that the pagan priesthood of old is now the Christian priesthood through the, the Catholic Church. And what's another word for pagan is just Lucifer worshiper. Yeah, because all the pagan gods are just pseudonyms for Satan. Yeah. He takes many forms and fashions, but it's the same one entity at the core of that. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know a lot because they're in heaven. No, that's not what it says. It says, but the dead know not anything, mm -hmm. neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. That's fairly clear to me. You know, I wouldn't, as like if I were investigating this, this would be like a powerful point. It wouldn't be the whole thing, but you start to find more yeah. and more of these statements throughout the Bible. And then you start seeing what Jesus said about Lazarus and defining him as asleep. Yeah. Uh, it becomes more and more clear. And with Lazarus, he didn't say, come on guys, I was in heaven enjoying myself. Why did you do this? Mm -hmm. Jesus, you know, like I was in paradise and you brought me back here. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then people will say, well, what about Moses? Because, uh, you know, Moses was there at the Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah. But we see in Jude that Michael had to go contend with the body of Moses yes. before. So where was, did Moses, the second he died, go straight up to heaven? No. Obviously not. Otherwise, where did, why did Michael come back to get him? Mm -hmm. And then it also uh, acts as a type for those who will be resurrected in the future with yes. Elijah being the type for those who will not see death when at the time of the second coming. So uh, all very connect, interconnected, interwoven, like Breaker was saying, the old and new aren't, aren't connected. The, the whole story is interwoven. It has to be connected or else they're not in unison. Yeah. But it's one unanimous book. Yeah. And, and the book is in harmony with itself from beginning to end. So of course it's it's connected. They're not, they're separate in a way, but they're, they're one story. Yeah. One was pre-Christ, one is, is post-Christ. And then in Job 34, verse 15, all flesh shall perish together 
and man shall turn again into dust. So again, our thoughts are gone yeah. and our, our body's dust. Back to dust. Yeah, it doesn't give any indication. And these are just two snapshots again, but you could look at many more verses. It doesn't yeah. give any indication that people are there. And, and we we're, at some point in the future, we'll look at the examples of why people say they are there. Yeah. But we, we just need to put them in the proper context and we'll see that this is exactly what happened. The dead know not anything until the resurrection. As Tyndall said, otherwise, mm -hmm. what's the point of the resurrection? Paul said the same thing. It's been reiterated over and over and over again. This great event of the resurrection and the second coming would not be as great if most of the people were there, except for the yes. ones alive on earth who would just be caught up at that moment anyway. So the whole thing would be very pointless uh, if if it weren't exactly as what the Bible says. Right, because it says our we will meet our loved ones again. Mm. So, but that's a whole nother, nother thing. So the doctrine of man's consciousness and death, essentially the belief that the spirits of the dead return to the minister to the living has prepared the way for modern spiritualism. So like it was, we talk more and more about spiritualism because as this gets to be like a reality, because we're early and we're yeah. trying to tell people in advance, but I have a feeling as this comes to pass and we keep, as long as we're allowed to keep talking about this stuff, more people are going to listen. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to define spiritualism around this idea of the dead returning. Uh, and this is what's going to play a big role, as we've looked yeah. at before. Here's a channel regarded as sacred through which Satan works for the accomplishment of his purposes. The And there's a whole, like... Uh, group like um, uh, Marina Abramovich, who's this, you know, Satanist in Hollywood, who they do seances with spirits, and they're actually dialoguing with spirits. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Jesuits, uh, there's information about them, that they get information from channeling spirits. Yeah. Uh, and so Satan uses these mechanisms, can even make, be, look like the good guy as mm -hmm. coming in, but none of those things are how God communicates, just like he didn't communicate through the witch of Endor right. uh, with Samuel. That wasn't Samuel. There are yeah. Christians who think that was really Samuel. But again, this is all why understanding this issue is important, yeah. because if this comes to pass, people who don't know these things, they're going to be absolutely blown away. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Yeah. Unless it's going to be so convincing. Yeah. It continues by saying the fallen angels who do his bidding appear as messengers from the spirit world while professing to bring the living into communication with the dead. The prince of evil exercises his bewitching influence upon their minds. This is very clear and this is what we believe that fallen angels, in other words demons, mm -hmm. are going to come and appear and have been. as they and have, have been like coming, this, but, it's but in, a, get, in a mass amount. Yes. It's going to get so overwhelming and so much more outward that it's going to, well, it's going to be this false Holy Spirit's movement. It's going to captivate yeah. the whole world's attention. It says in uh, Great Controversy 550, nowhere in the sacred scriptures is found the statement that the righteous go to their reward or the wicked to their punishment at death. The patriarchs and prophets have left no such assurance. Christ and his apostles have given no hint of it. The Bible clearly teaches that the dead do not go to heaven Im immediately to heaven. They are represented as sleeping until the resurrection. And if they're all sleeping, can it be your dead husband or your dead wife or your dead mom or your dead grandma? Is it possible for them to communicate with you? Are they watching over you and hovering? You know, and, and when I say this, I'm trying to be very mindful that there are loved ones who think that, you know, people who think that their loved ones are doing this and find comfort in that. But I would ask those people to just let God be your comfort. Let Jesus be your comfort that you will meet them again because he is worthy, because he has the life. And so therefore, you don't need your loved one to be watching over you and comforting you because Christ is comforting you and has taken care of your loved one who's resting peacefully. You know, when we talk about this subject, heaven is supposed to be, be free of pain and suffering and all these things. And can you imagine if they're up there looking down and they see all the pain that maybe you're going through, because not everybody has an easy life and they can't do anything about it. They would be begging to leave there and come help because they're, they don't see the end from the beginning. They don't see how this is all going to play out. And they'd be, let, let me do something. Let me help. Why, why did I have to go? It would be um, agonizing. Yeah, it would not be a peaceful, lovely experience that, that they'd be going through. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. And, and hopefully people can find comfort. Like they don't 
if it if it isn't how they think that it is, they don't somehow blame God for that. Like God is yeah. still good, <clears throat> even if you have to change your understanding to fit what the book says rather than what you want to believe. And that is ultimately what our battle is here is like challenging what we want to believe versus what the Bible says yeah. and choosing to do that instead, even if it feels like it's not right or doesn't feel natural to us, but like we are naturally at enmity with God. So there is going to be some pain, so to speak, yeah. as you learn what the reality is. And for some people, this is a very painful like idea, yet if you really understood it, it would be very peaceful and like perfectly exactly how it should be when you understand like the point you were making like it's better that they're asleep until all this is over and when we we were just talking about Lazarus with Lazarus when uh, Jesus was asking you know where he is and everything they said that he's asleep and then Jesus said I'm going to go wake him up and they didn't realize that he knew what he was saying. They thought he was talking about asleep and, and they responded, no, he's dead. And then they said, we know that he'll be brought to life again mm -hmm. at the resurrection day. Yeah. So they understood that he didn't go straight to heaven. Yeah. They said, oh, we understand this, that he'll be resurrected on the last day. Yeah. And we have this, this comfort and, uh, but we know that he was resurrected before the last day. But that was a an extra supernatural event that wasn't a uh, something that, and it wasn't his soul that came out of the grave. It was him, whole being, you know, not decomposing and put back to normal right. normal flesh. Yeah. But that was something that. Christ did as an example of what he is going to to show us. Yeah, and that he has the power within him to, to lay down his life and the power to pick it back yes. up. And not to tackle this today, but like people think God the Father brought Jesus back, but Jesus brought Jesus back. He had the life within himself. That's why he said, I have the power to put it down. I have the power to pick it back up. And so it wouldn't be, he wouldn't have that be true if God the Father had had to do that for him. And so there's a there's a lot in understanding what Christ was trying to do in showing raising Lazarus from the dead. The reason why he waited so long to go there, so nobody could say that it was a he wasn't really dead, like he was yeah. starting to decompose. Yeah. You know, and and God can show Jesus shows that he he has this within himself, and it was the very thing that got him got him killed. We keep talking about this world united. And they're in order for a world to be united, can they be united and have like violently opposed ideologies? No. No. So they have to be together in mindset, on doctrine. And that's yeah. exactly what Great Controversy and, you know, the Bible uh, points to it. And she kind of gives the details about it. Uh, what it says, it says, when the leading churches of the United States, and I'll, I'll, I'll venture to say once more, there will be no non-SDA uh, groups telling you that this is all going down in America and it's going to happen in the churches. Yeah. So I, I hope that um, people who give us a hard time as this starts to happen will appreciate that we did so in the face of what all the opposition was yeah. saying. So the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state, that is the church-state system, to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions. Then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy. So this is the setting up of the image of the beast. Yep. This is how important this is. And the way that they get there, the points that they hold in common, Sunday and immortality of the soul. And this will lead to the forming of the image of the beast, which is why the church state system makes sense, because that's what the beast had when it still had its power. And when I say the beast, it's the first beast of Revelation 13 and the second beast yeah. being Protestant America. And then that goes into, and why we're connecting this there, because it says they bring fire down from heaven, they're going to do miracles and even raise people from the dead yep. and enforcing then their laws. People, religious laws. Yeah, and people thinking that you'll never unite church and state. Wait till these miracles start to occur. Wait till it seems like dead people come back and watch the fervency that and, people and ask And things in America are going to get much worse before they get better. Unfortunately, yeah. And, and even uh, when they get better, it will just be cleaning up. It's the order up cow. You know, uh, 
Antonio Guterres from the United Nations, former head of Socialist International and hardcore Roman Catholic, pro-Pope Francis, pro-Jesuit, yeah. came out and said, we're entering the age of chaos. And as we've looked at early episodes, when we started the Ordo Ab Cal, the Order Out of Chaos, yeah. the Freemason mantra, and masonry really being controlled by Jesuitism, being controlled through the, the hierarchies that we're going to poke at at some point down the line, uh, we, we see that it's all it all fits together uh, neatly here. And just as we were saying, the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. So we're, we're staking our, our flags in the ground here and saying whether we're right or wrong, we're, this is what we're saying is the truth. And we're saying it clear enough that people will have enough time to digest it yeah. and choose for themselves. When you see these things, know that it was foretold that this would happen. Yep. And that we're telling you guys the truth. And it's not like we're trying to say everyone else is wrong. It's inconsequential if everyone else is wrong. We're just trying to tell you the truth. That's the point. And if it's the truth and it happens to be other people aren't telling the truth, that's I'm, that's not our thing. We're just trying to tell you what we think is the truth and why we think it's the truth. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power and under the influence of the threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome and trampling on the rights of conscience. I want to just emphasize and people might think it's strange, but it says that they're reaching over the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. And it's connecting that with Rome. But people think, well, they're, it's, that's not spiritualism. That's just Christians, right? But the spiritualism part is that these doctrines, and we've gone over this at large to do with the Roman Catholicism, is just baptized paganism it's coming from these spiritualist places it has this ritualist mystical sort of background to it and it's not based on the biblical stance it's based on tradition and spiritualism is at the core of that yeah and and so you have this like sunday which everyone's already adopted you don't have to convince anyone to do and now it says the protestants are the foremost in grasping the hands of spiritualism. So that tells me that's like Eve. They don't know their doctrine, and so they're being subtly yeah. seduced into the doctrine of the devil, which is the immortality of the soul. And because they're not teaching the right doctrine, they're now believing the lie going back to Eden, and they yeah. don't even realize that they're the false prophet yet. There's going to have to be a whole droves of people that come out of these churches when they start realizing this. That statement of... Satan at through the serpent in the Garden of Eden was the start of spiritualism. That was the that was the culmination of mm. it. So now we're gonna see how the Catholic Church has used these two errors to unite the churches since she got her mortal wound all that time ago. So it's like a little uh Christian religious lesson that mm -hmm. we're gonna walk through here. And I found these things interesting, so hopefully our audience does too. So three major branches of Christianity. You've got uh, Catholicism, which is based on scripture and tradition, which the Pope cites that he has authority over both. Mm -hmm. uh, Orthodox, which is scripture and tradition, but it's like this mystic tradition. So it has a lot more of the mysticism aspect uh, associated with it. And then Protestants really made the, their like stand on this sola scriptura, yeah. right? That was like the, the Bible, and the Bible, Bible and the Bible alone. Unfortunately, I don't think we could define Protestants as such today, but this was what these three were based on yeah, and how they differ. And now I would just say, if, if God were to sub, uh, subscribe to one of these, which one, just based on the Bible, which one is he asking us well, to obviously do? Obviously, it's going to be God's word alone. It's God's word alone. And anybody who says the tradition part, go do a Bible study on what God thinks about tradition. Tradition, Because <laughs> we could do a whole lot on that, and it's not good. Yeah, He says it's pretty much the... the <laughs> the thorn you, in the you, side of humanity. Well, that's what Jesus said right to the Pharisees. You get rid of God's law for your tradition. Yeah. So you make it of none effect. And that's exactly what's taking place. There's nothing new under the sun. We keep saying this. It's the same mistake we're making from the beginning. Yeah. It needs to be based on the Bible and the Bible alone. And it's tough. Like when there's Bible verses that says you have to leave mother, brother, husband, 
you know, father, son, any, anything, if it means for Christ's sake, like it's not saying do that if you don't have to, it's saying if you must, you must choose Christ over all. And unfortunately, uh, people hold on to tradition so much, they find nostalgia in it. And I'll use Christmas like as a good example for a lot of people. There's a way to like witness for Christmas, but the vast majority of the world is not using that holiday, nor is December 25th anything to do with with Jesus. But yet to break free from that, or in Judaism say to accept Jesus as the Messiah, you have to break free from all tradition, all family ties. It's really, really hard. Christ asked us to do those things if it calls for it. Yeah. And I think that we should trust him when he says he'll carry us through those things and we don't have to be afraid to leave tradition behind. Even if we think we're losing, we're actually gaining in Christ. Okay, and now we're going to read from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it starts like this, for Holy Mother Church. I just want to stop right there. Okay. <laughs> How many churches on planet Earth say that phrase? The one. 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 Can there be multiple mothers in this situation? No. One no, mother. Because it's mother of all b- belief, all world, yeah. everything. Catholic even means... In a, even in a woke society, there's still only one mother that's birthing the one child. That's true. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> we, can, we haven't figured that one out yet. Yeah. <laughs> so it says, for Holy Mother Church, relying on the faith of the apostolic age accepts as sacred and canonical, the books of the Old and New Testaments, whole and entire, with all their parts, on the grounds that, written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author and have been handed on as such to the church herself. Now, I think everybody who thinks they're going to be witnessing uh, in the end and knowing that the papacy is going to be, you know, the, the head of the system should keep this quote Because in it, it tells us that the Catholic Church admits that God is the author of the Bible, the Old and the New Testament. So if you are brought before councils and criticized for what you believe, you can ask whether or not the Bible is of man or is of God. Yeah. And if they say of God, then you say, I have to follow every single thing that's in here. Because if they say that it's of man, then you don't need to follow it at all. Yeah. But if they say that it's of God and they don't deny that God is the author, then it allows you the opportunity to say, what do you want me to do? You have said that God's the author here. I'm following the book. You're, you're the one saying something different. I'm following the book and you have said God's the author. Yeah. Why are you persecuting me? Well, they, they do a contradiction at the same time, because in the same breath, they'll say that they have the authority somehow higher than God to change it. And that is not in the scriptures. So right. that that is where like you can say, well, your catechism says this, but then you also say this. You're inconsistent with yourself and with the scriptures. Yeah. I'm sorry. If you can the compel Bible me from the scriptures, I will. it never changes. Exactly. So if the Bible itself is saying it never changes, and those who go to remove one jot or tittle from this book and that's what they're claiming to do without the endorsement of the scripture itself then we have a conflict Uh, exactly and by their own words whose authority are we supposed to follow the authority of the one who authored the book to begin with so i just found that fascinating in the same place where they're calling themselves the mother they give us the ammunition to be able to stand on the bible as god being the author without Mm -hmm. error uh even though other statements from them may infer otherwise. The Holy Mother continues to speak. (laughs) Salvation comes from God alone, but because we receive life of faith through the church, she is our mother. Because she is our mother, she is also our teacher in faith. So the idea is, yes, okay, God gives you the salvation, but you can't really have faith, which is what you need to obtain salvation, unless you get it from your mother, because your mother has to teach you these things. Mm -hmm. And so again, she becomes the, 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 intercessor yeah. in between God and and uh, and his his people which we know that biblically we can go straight to Christ we can go straight to the source straight to the Bible to find our answers we don't need to go through some institution or not even an institution but an individual who they place there who who knows what what really they think or do or act yeah and we're going through a fallible person now, who is not God, hasn't died for us, 
to give us an entrance to our salvation, access to our faith and everything else. And I didn't put this in here, but I have a great Pope Francis clip where he's like, don't think you can go to Jesus alone. This is a silly misunderstanding. Like you can't, you can't go to Jesus alone. And then he offers Mary as this, like, you, you don't want to experience the wrath of Jesus. You, he, you know, you're a sinner. You may, he may just destroy you. So go to his mother. His mother's in good with him. But again, what does the scripture says? The Bible says, who is my mother, my brothers, who is them that do the will of God? They are those who are my family, basically. You know, this, is, this gets into a totally different subject. But I think this understanding of Christ is really important because he is not human. He is God. He created all of us. Obviously, he had respect for Mary as the woman who birthed him sure. and everything, but he was still her creator. He's not subsidiary to Mary now. No. So we're looking at this a, a very wrong when we take Christ and we pull him down to a, a completely human level. Yeah. He's not completely human. Which is what shows like the He's our creator. Deal. Like the chosen tries to humanize him. He's this Jesus gets us. There was a Super Bowl commercial with foot washing where Jesuit was washing the foot of a homosexual or transvestite. And he's like, Jesus would do this. He gets us. And it's this idea that like Jesus doesn't have any boundaries. He's just love. But then in his word, again, not according to the word, if you love me, keep my commandments. Those who say he loves me and keeps not com my commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Yeah. They want to leave all that stuff out. We talked about this, but Jesus is the creator. He's the one who brought the commandments. He was the one, you know, all these scenarios. At the will of the Father, by the way. Like, we're not saying, like, the Father's not involved. This was all done sure. at the will of the Father. Sure. But he's not now, you know, entirely human. All the things he did, he doesn't remember anymore. And Mary can go to him and almost like they portray it in a seductive way, mm -hmm. because they do do it in a seductive way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Mary almost seduces Jesus as like this human being and is able to mediate for you because she can soften him and, and everything. But we're told that Jesus is our mediator and God the Father is the judge. So he's already in mediation for us. He's our high priest. He's the one who's intercessing for us. We don't need a human to now try and convince God to be more merciful on us. Mm -hmm. He is all merciful, right? Right from the get-go. There's no, no question if he's full of mercy. Yeah. And so uh, the Catholic ideology is kind of seeps out. And I even have, you know, family members who are kind of cut from that cloth a little bit. And they're looking at uh, old saints and like worshiping them. Uh, so it's like a really trickle down, bad trickle down effect yeah. where you, now you're like breaking the commandments of God, which he, even the Catholic church admits it, you don't want to be on the other end of that without your mediator. Yeah. And that's the problem. You choose the wrong mediator. You're basically standing there on your own mm -hmm. and you don't want that. <laughs> None of us want that. I wouldn't even want my worst enemies to have that. I'd rather them know Jesus and live than, than to be uh, on Satan's side in the end. So we see the the mother teaches us our faith. The church is the mother of all believers. Now, is she saying all Christian? Do you see a caveat there? Christian believers? All believers. I think it's inferring because the word Catholic means universal. Universal. It's not excluding the other groups, even if they're they're yeah. heathens. They're still the the over all of them. They still have the souls, or what they would say, they're immortal souls. Yeah. And at their they're standing at the gate as arbiters of whether they right. get in or out. It says, no one can have God as father who does not have the church as mother. Wow. That's incredible. That to me is, is you know, as damning as a uh, herit, herit, heretical statement that could be said by a single person yeah. or organization. And just as an analogy, uh, and this is kind of clear in the parables of Jesus, but God could not be married to something that is subservient to him like that like a like he created us from the dust of the earth and now he's equal to in a sense this church which would not make 
you know, would not make logical sense. Mm -mm. Yeah. And it's just one of those statements that, um, that stands out to me again is like, the Bible doesn't say this. So which one am I supposed to uphold, even if I'm persecuted or anyone's persecuted for that? So now here, we're going to jump over to an Ellen White statement, because we see here, you know, she says she's the mother of all the, all believers. And this mother has also made statements that she has a mark. Yeah. What does this mother say that her mark is? Sunday. It's observance. Sunday. And we've just done so many episodes that now that we're seeing through her own words, she's saying, I'm the mother and I have this mark to show yeah. who I am. We now see through this statement that she's the mother of harlots that we see. And we see that the mother is not the daughters, but separate and distinct from them. Mm -hmm. She has, and we see it, the daughters in Revelation 17, I believe it is, 16 or 17, that the daughters are in there. And if there's mother, if you're a mother, you can't be a mother without the children, right. right? So you need to have children. Who are those children? The daughters of the Protestant sects, and they're the next to come on the stage and act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints. So yeah. think about this for a second. If we're saying really that American Protestantism is this da these daughters, and this is saying that they're coming on the world stage next, and she's going to persecute like the mother did during the 1260, what did Rome do during the Dark Ages? What did the Vatican do? During the Dark Ages, they tortured, they flayed, they lit people on fire. Yeah. Like it was a dark time. There was, was no religious awful. freedom. There was no political freedom. There was no freedom at all. It's it was almost the completed new world order back then. Right. And then the Reformation came in and reversed all of that. Mm -hmm. And even Henry Kissinger has said that the biggest thing that stopped the new world order from being completed was the reformation yeah. incredible quote and so we see are the are the protestants doing what the mother did today they're starting to it's starting to heat up mm -hmm. but they're not flaying people in the streets yet so we're starting to see like the 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 development is going in the direction of this religious system. And the end result of it is exactly what the B Revelation 13 says. The second beast will have all the power of the first beast before it. So this is not a stretch to say that they will persecute like the mother did during the 1260. What was the thing that the Puritans and everything were leaving Europe for? Religious freedom. Mm -hmm. They were leaving so that they could have a constitution where... The person has their own rights and that they have the freedom to worship in any way that they see fit and that that would not be forced by state. Separation of church and state. That was the goal. And they even made it so that they would not keep, uh, and they were, they were fleeing persecution from Catholicism, mm -hmm. but they didn't even want to do the reverse. So they didn't say, Oh, a, uh, a Catholic cannot be part of this because they didn't want to do the reverse. Yeah. But now we are going to end up doing the reverse. Yeah. Because we're removing those barriers from church and state. We've showed clips. We've showed so many things where people say, I don't believe in church and state. This isn't what it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to have church and state. And Trump is removing all those barriers or he, he did remove all those barriers. And Biden has kept in the same path and then if we continue going in this right swing i'm not saying we should go in a left swing but it's it's like we're we're stuck between a rock and a hard place at yeah. this point but yeah. people just need to be aware so they don't end up choosing to go along with something that they think is good yeah seductive seducing spirit but a doctrine of the devil. Exactly right. <clears throat> and so if we're going to see these daughters exercise the power the mother once had, left and right are going to end in the same place. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter. Like left will be destroyed by right or left will destroy right. It doesn't really, really matter. The end result is this world religious system that's going to be played out by the Protestant churches. I know I sound like a broken record here, but people will play these in the future, hopefully at some point, or maybe it's scrubbed from the internet, who knows? But this is what's going to happen in the future. And, just and we're watch. not being like nihilist or something like this. We're just trying to make you aware because we are pro freedom of choice on yeah. all these fronts. That's yeah. what we promote. We're yeah. not promoting left, right, up, down. It's 
freedom. On these things, you cannot be judging people's conscience. And to have your refuge be in Jesus Christ. Like, you're not married to your denomination. You're not married to your country. You are married to your Savior. And the, the only one who can cover our sins, the only one who can carry us through these things, just like he carried Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah and all these guys through like being swept off. Imagine being pulled out of here with chains on and we get yeah. sent to a foreign country that hates who we are and and God still protects us. He put yeah. Daniel second basically in command. Mm -hmm. He put Joseph second in command. Like. Yeah. That's ultimately why we're trying to share with this, this with people is so that you're not afraid to choose Christ in everything and know that he can deliver you through yeah. all of that stuff. Let's look at this timeline of reconciliation between the mother and the daughters based on our understanding of things. Because uh, if the, the Protestant churches are the daughters and they're going to unite church and state, have all the power that the, the mother had, well, it says at the end when it does that, that all uh, the deadly wound would be healed. Yeah. So at the end result of this Protestant church is that the mother is back to life, yeah. fully back to life, not on life support, but in, fully in full control, full control. And so something has to happen to get this reconciliation, this unification. And when we look at the timeline, we see it's been this remarkably long drawn out effort yeah. by the devil to bring every un everybody under one banner once again. So 538 AD to 1798, that's the classic 1260 uh, prophecy that uh, Adventists talk about, the day-year principle. That is the 1260-year time of papal persecution where Napoleon's army goes in and pulls the Pope out and it receives this deadly wound in 1798. Yeah. Then the imagine like the, the wound happens. Now you get... You, you, you're in terrible shape. You're just starting to come back to life and you've got this long road ahead to get back into your full shape again. And that's what happens between 1798 and 1929 or so, which is when you start seeing basically the French and American revolutions and America starts after 1798 really rises as this world power. Yeah, And it, it has, since 1798, America has become the most powerful nation in the world, yeah. you know, on the surface. We could argue semantics behind the scenes kind of thing. But America and 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 the French Revolution and this whole kind of thing all happened post uh, the, the mother receiving her deadly wound. Now, in 1929, what happens there? We get this Lateran Treaty. So America is rises as this world power. And the daughters, like, you think about all what came out of the Protestant Reformations. You had Methodists and Baptists and Lutherans and all of these offshoots starting to come to life. And that's what happened between 1798 and 1929. So here come the daughters in that window. The yeah. mother receives her wound right as America becomes a, a, a world power. And inside of that world power, all the daughters spring up. Yeah. And people can kind of see that th that's when the daughters started really rising in power, just like the statement said. We see all these different churches just popping out and... You know, like we've mentioned before, there's like 40,000 different Christian denominations. Exactly. And this is predominantly was taking place during those periods. Mm -hmm. There was a huge, you know, explosion of all this. And, you know, the devil works in this way that he adds one little tweak here, one little tweak there, one little tweak there, and makes so much confusion that we can't even make, make straight anymore mm -hmm. by just a mass of information that makes it really hard to go through. But then this brings us to 1929, which is the Lateran tre Treaty signed. So this, a lot of people reference as the start or or as the wound being, being healed. Like fully healed, yeah. But if that was fully healed, we would see a much different situation globally, yeah. right? Because when the papacy was at its apex, that's during the 1260 years, it was the number one world power. And do we see the papacy as the number one world power right now? Well, the answer is no. No, nor are there inquisitions, nor are they inventing new torture tactics. I mean, maybe they are behind the scenes, but like <laughs> there are, there's none of the classic telltale signs of what yes. Rome was during the 1260 yet. The Lateran Treaty, really what it did was it just gave acknowledgement to the sovereignty of the Holy See. Exactly, yeah. So it, it, it had this political side taken away in 1798 when the Pope was taken captive. Mm -hmm. And then it was given a partial acknowledgement back. But 
they're still not having this like global influence uh, authoritatively. Yeah. So once that is going to be fully recompensed, then it will be fully healed again. And we're certainly not saying like the Jesuits somehow went quiet and they stopped working. Like they never stopped, but they didn't have the outward public ability to do yeah. whatever they want to whoever they want. And the other thing is when, if we're talking about a total healing of the wound, we have to know the history, and uh, I don't want to make this long, but of the 1260-year prophecy. Mm -hmm. That starts in 538 AD. What happened there is really critical because in 538, there was a universal Sunday law. Because once the papacy got its full control, that's its mark. That's its first thing. If we're in control, this is what we do. Sunday, you know it's <coughs> us when you see Sunday there. Yeah. So if we don't have a universal Sunday law, we're not there yet. But once that takes place, we can know that wound is completely healed. Exactly. And obviously that hasn't happened yet. So can the wound start healing? Sure. Can it be growing as they grow in strength and, and, and we power? See it healing. And that's what's happened. That's exactly mm -hmm. what's happened. So that's what happened in 29. It started to heal, but it didn't fully heal. Then 1929 to 1948... Protestantism just explodes in America and it starts making inroads in other countries. Yeah. And you start seeing like places where you didn't really see different Christian denominations before really, you know, blossoming and growing. <clears throat> and you had this go on for quite some time. Now we get to 1948. And something happens in 1948. This, the daughters have been growing and growing, just as uh, the Ellen White uh, quote said. Uh, they're getting more and more in numbers. And the, but, the daughters are still separate from the mother. And so here comes this group called the World Council of Churches. It forms in 1948 around the same time as the League of Nations, which would become yep. the United Nations. Like there's a lot of this like ecumenical organizations that spring Universalism. up. Yes. And so like it's almost like this globalism paving the way for the new world yep. order, which they knew would be far down the line. But in the late 40s, the consolidation effort uh, begins. Imagine you're the mother and you want to gather your daughters together, but there's mm -hmm. one here and one here and one here and one here, and you can't go to each one of them separately. The best way to do it is Family to create reunion. a new umbrella <laughs> to put them all under. Yeah, And this is where the World Council of Churches comes in. But know that the World Council of Churches, one of the main missing members is the Roman Catholic Church. The mother won't join this particular organization. So let's look a little bit about this World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches, WCC, is a worldwide ecumenical organization that brings together various Christian denominations and churches to promote unity, common witness, and Christian service. The member churches and denominations of the WCC include... Now, hold on one second. So the very nature of this is ecumenical, and that's yeah. a big fancy word for saying unify. Yeah. Unity, it doesn't matter the doctrine, Regardless let's come together. Truth. Exactly. Let's come together in the in the name of cooperationism yeah. versus separationism. That's what the Jesuit document used that mm -hmm. advocated for the church state system. And we know that's exactly against what Jesus said, because he said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Yeah. I came to separate mother, mother from daughter, father from son. Because of truth, yep. not not just to separate people, but because the truth is like the great cleaver of truth, it divides. And the sword is not a literal sword, but the word of God, right. which which is what cuts asunder down to the very soul. Yes. So the idea that it's like promoting unity and common witness, and I'll just say like common good, mm -hmm. this idea of commonality uh, is very mother. That's the that's papal yep. language. And so like if you wanted to start infusing and have all the daughters adopting thing, you put them under this umbrella and you start infusing your ideas into the organization. Yeah. And now the organization gives this peer pressure that these denominations start going through. And you could look at women's ordination or the trans or homosexual movement, like, and you see the churches positions change over the years, yeah. a large part from groups like the World Council of Churches, which it starts top down, and mm -hmm. you see this trickle effect over time. So we have the Orthodox churches, including the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch, and all the East, and the Russian Orthodox Church. So people 
maybe don't know much about the Orthodox Church, but it's obviously the dominant one over in, in mm-hmm. Russia and in that region of the world. It's very prominent. They have different kind of calendar. They have different schedules. They yeah. have different traditions. Um, People might be a little more familiar with it now because of the interview that has been spoken of with Tucker Carlson and uh, Putin, and he mentioned are the religious things in that interview as well. Yeah. What's interesting about that is at some point we'll break down how they're all part of the Red String Club. Go look at Tucker Carlson's wrist. He's wearing a red string. Go look for yeah. Vladimir Putin wearing a red string and go Google what the Red String uh, Club is. It's related to the Kabbalah uh, and cab- Kabbalism. So um, we will be touching on that in the future, but all the world's a stage, Mackenzie, yeah. including that interview, uh, we'll look at another time. Okay, so the Anglican churches are also in there, and that's like the Church of England, uh, the Church of the United States, the Anglican Church of Canada, the Episcopal Church uh, of the United States. So, again, very prominent, but kind of cut from the cloth of of uh, Catholicism. The Protestant Reformed churches, and so now we're getting into more of the, the daughters. You see mm-hmm. Presbyterians, Methodists, Evangelical, Lutherans, uh, and the United Church of Christ, which we'll look at a little bit later. You have the Baptist churches, the Pentecostal and Charismatic churches, the Old Catholic churches, which is kind of an interesting offshoot. It's different than the mainstream main, mainstream one. Uh, the Oriental Orthodox churches, which is kind of more like uh, uh, the Russian Orthodox in, in their mm-hmm. uh, schools of thought. But notably, the Catholic Church is not a member of mm-hmm. this group. Okay, so... You have this World Council and you have, look at the amount of, of the Christian denominations that are now falling under this umbrella. Yeah. We looked at, at the beginning, you had uh, Catholic Church, Orthodox, and Protestants. And here, the, the mothers over here, but Orthodox and Protestants have now joined in the World yeah. Council of Churches. Okay. So then what happens? Almost between 49 and 61, almost all major Christian denominations joined the World Council of Churches. Yeah. So that was just at the beginning who was at in 1948. Mm-hmm. Now, over time, they continue growing in, in numbers. Then between 62 and 65, the Second Vatican Council occurred. And something interesting happened at that Vatican Council. They issued this decree called the Restoration of Unity. And we saw in the World Council mission statement, the idea is unity. Yeah. And so they issue this decree and they're like, Imagine it's the mother, mm-hmm. and the mother's like, "I'm decreeing, I want the daughters. I want to get the daughters together. I want, I want unity. I want them to come home. Let's start bringing them together. Let's let's do more to make that happen." Catholic social teaching, exactly. That's what it is. It's it's the unification of all these these religions under one banner, and obviously, it's going to be under the Catholic banner the because mothers, yeah. what is their mark? They said Sunday. Mm-hmm. All these are Sunday following churches. So automatically we're unified because they are actually following Catholic social doctrine. Yeah. And is the mother going to start following the daughters or is she expecting the daughters to follow? Daughters have to follow. They suit. have to. Yeah. And so she's not, this is not like a, let's, let's have unity. And you know what? Mom was wrong. I'm going to uh, accept you, Lutheran daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're, it's actually, why don't you take the lead because your doctrine is right. That will never happen well, ever. we've seen this in, boy, that's uh, quite a few years ago now, but with Tony Palmer, mm. where he's not Catholic, but he almost seemed like he was Catholic with the amount of apolog- apologies he was giving for all the reformers and what was happening and mm-hmm. uh, voicing the Catholic Church as the mother and... Uh, we need to go back to her and all these things. Yeah. So it, there's this huge push that go, going in that direction. Yeah. And so 65, the tw- 62 to 65, this Vatican Council is kind of happening. They issue this decree. And in 1965, just coincidentally, the World Council of Churches joins a, a joint working group with the Catholic Church. So the mother's like, I'm not going to join you, but here's what we'll do. We'll set up a little committee together. We'll yeah. work together. And our goal is to unify Christianity under the mother, because mm-hmm. that's always the, the the goal. And then it says by between 66 and 60, uh, 71, the World Council of Churches bring in full adoption of the Pentecostal and Charismatic Churches. Now, I, I want people to stop and think about why this is important. We've talked about miracles and healings and all of this stuff. What is the main thing that comes with Pentecostal and Charismatic? Miracles and spiritual Holy Spirit experiences. Tongues. Exactly. So the 
the mother and the daughters get together in the 60s to unite Christianity. And what's born out of this union is the adoption of Pentecostal and charismatic churches, Mm -hmm. which just takes us one step closer to this world that's taken storm by fire that comes down from heaven, which let's say it's a false Holy Spirit. This, these are the churches mm-hmm. that would be at the head of that movement yeah. and the evangelical movement as a whole. So as it says, you know, Pentecostals and Charismatics generally believe in the ongoing manifestation of miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, healings, speaking in tongues, prophecy. Again, I don't think they're using the word prophecy right uh, because they're, I've seen some... Uh, I think we've even had clips of some of their the people who are saying, "Oh, I'm getting the message. I'm I'm speaking on behalf of the Holy Spirit." Like that's dangerous stuff. Yeah. You got to be really careful with that because that's not how prophecy works anymore. And it's these groups that have brought this stuff in. And so, and, and that's probably something we need to do on another episode in the future. Is what's the definition of prophecy? What's the definition of the Holy Spirit giving prophecy and a prophet? And what takes place when a prophet is receiving a message or giving a message. That's a good one, yeah. So those that's a whole another, you know, we could do multiple episodes. Yeah, I was on gonna that. say a reaction video watching one of these prophets of these other groups and breaking down why it's not biblical might also be interesting. Yeah. Um, so just to give a visual, here's the mother over here, and look at all the daughters on the other side right? As you have a very clear distinction between the two factions. And at the end of the day, what you find is as different and as they seem to be on the two most important points, the two pillars of the end time era, Sunday, Sunday sacredness, sacredness, immortality of the mm-hmm. soul, they are exactly the same. Yeah. And we're just going to quickly run through what that looks like. So here it says, Catholics believe in the immortality of the soul and that after death, the soul immediately faces a particular judgment by God. The soul is then either welcomed into heaven purified in purgatory, are sent to hell. Now, obviously, purgatory is not a word that ever shows up in the Bible. It's not even a biblical concept. That is a totally traditional concept, but that's for another time. Mm -hmm. Purgatory is seen as a temporary state of purification for souls that are not yet ready to enter heaven, but are not condemned to hell. Catholics also believe in the resurrection of the body at the end of time. When Christ will return and raise the dead to life, at this point, the soul will be reunited with the resurrected body. This belief is based on the teachings of Jesus and the writings of St. Paul in the New Testament. So it's a gross mischaracterization of what Paul wrote. We we could go point story by story in each one and show why uh, purgatory does not exist, why it makes no sense that you would go either to heaven or hell and then come back in the resurrection. Let's say you're in hell. Well, you're still coming back to be resurrected and be judged and then sent back to yes. hell. It, it doesn't <laughs> make coaster. sense. It's a very redundant system. Um, okay, so that's pretty clear. I think anybody who wants to know about this stuff already kind of knows the purgatory doctrine with yeah. Catholicism. But they say, it says, the soul immediately faces a particular judgment. Immediately. And that, I think, is the key that we want to fo- focus in on if we're looking... Yeah. If the mother's doctrine are trickling down to the daughters, let's say they all share the same doctrine. Let's say that that's the case. Yeah. Well, who had that first, the daughters or the mother? The mother. So like if they're all the same, you can't just say, oh, well, we also believe that. You got it from yes. the source and the source is the mother. And it kind of varies, like not all of them have purgatory, but they still have the soul immediately faces judgment by God at the time of death, which isn't And that's difficult. a very um, important point, which we're going to touch on starting in a couple following episodes, because this spills into something else that we've mentioned, which is this 70 weeks and 2300 days mm-hmm. and this this time frame, because when we look in the Bible, judgment is an event. It's not something that just when everyone dies, everyone goes through a judgment process and it's just random as people die. No, it's it's a sequential event that takes place. And that's, that's the same thing we believe about hellfire. Is mm-hmm. this an event? It's not a, a constant uh, being of something. Right. So that's a very important point, and that's going to play into future discussions. Sure does. So let's see if this doctrine of the mother carries in to the daughters. Anglican teachings. Okay, the Anglican church, church teaches that the soul of the dead goes to either heaven or hell immediately mm-hmm. after death. 
exists, uh, believe is in the existence of a purification place called purgatory. Okay. Did they get that from the mother? Or did the Anglicans come up with that themselves? Got that from the okay, mother. Okay. So the Anglicans are under the mother. Let's see the Baptists. The Baptists believe at the moment of death, at the moment. So immediately, the soul of the believer immediately is in the presence of God. Okay. Did they get that from the mother? Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as soul sleep. So they didn't, that's not yeah. biblical. Lutherans generally believe at the time of death, the soul immediately departs. They don't believe in soul sleep. The Methodists, Methodists believe a person goes to hell, heaven or hell when they die. So this is again, immediately after yeah. they die. The Episcopalians says the soul goes immediately mm -hmm. while the body remains on earth to the resurrection. So there's the other mother's part that it's going to be, they're going to immediately go and then come back in the body for the time of the event and then go back to heaven or yeah. hell when they're done. So again, did the Episcopalians come up with that or the mother? Mother. The, so the mother, uh, the Episcopalians are under the mother as well. Presbyterians immediately go to heaven or hell. Pentecostals immediately go mm -hmm. to heaven or hell. Charismatics, it's the same thing. Now there is one in this group that's different. The Church of Christ, maybe they got it right. Well, they don't emphasize doctrine. They just preach social justice and inclusivity. Hmm. Maybe that's not the place to find our answers yep. after all, uh, because they won't even tell you to prepare for something because they're not interested in knowing what to prepare for. So then you get to these silly SDAs, which suggest that there's this concept called soul sleep, which is matches all the wording in the Bible uh, regarding the nature of what uh, people who pass uh, are currently doing, which suggests that the soul is in a dormant or unconscious state after death until the resurrection. Okay. They believe that at the second coming of Jesus Christ, the righteous dead will be resurrected and taken to heaven. But that happens at the event, not right. immediately after death. While the unrighteous will remain dead until the end of the millennium, at which point will be the resurrected for the judgment. Okay. So this is future episode stuff, but yeah. just keep in mind that we're saying that the thousand year period doesn't happen here on earth where most of the world is going to tell you that it's happening here on earth. Yeah. We say it's happening in heaven, and during that time, Satan, it says, he's sitting mm -hmm. here for a thousand years, and the earth is a desolate wasteland with no one to, to trick. And that millennium is taking place after the second coming. After the second coming. So this isn't something that, you know, we get raptured up and then a thousand years, and no. So what we believe is, is biblical, is the second coming happens, Christ comes, the dead in Christ rise First, first, it says, mm -hmm. and then we are taken up in the air and we go to heaven. And in that case, there is kind of a rapture at that moment because it is people leaving. But it's not secret. But it's not it's secret. It's an extremely loud rapture. And it doesn't... It says the trumpets, the earthquakes, everything is just shaking the whole world. Yeah, and as people are being translated, the people of the world are being destroyed. There's nobody living uh, at the end of this whole catastrophe, except for Satan who sits here for a thousand years. Yeah. And you either are translated up or raised with the, the dead in Christ, or you're going down to sleep for the next thousand mm -hmm. years. Uh, but all these things we can touch on on later. But the the doctrine that the millennium happens here on earth, there's oh, the Jews are, are thinking that's going to happen. The Pentecostals, the evangelicals, they're all thinking that's going to happen. Yeah. So when Satan, as we've advocated, comes pretending to be Jesus, and it's not this seven-year period dispensation where the Antichrist shows up. No, people are going to think this guy is Jesus yeah. Christ. And then at that point, he's going to say, We've started the millennium here on earth. And because most of the world already think that's going to happen, people are going to be ready for that deception. And then he will rally the rest of the people and say, we got a clean house. Yeah. And that's where this, this last step in Revelation 13 starts to take place. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, that the two pillars that the mother gets the whole world under, it's not just Christian churches, because as we said, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Taoism, all yeah. of these other beliefs that are like these Eastern religions... Uh, all have immortality of the soul. They may not have the Sunday sacredness, but guess what they do have? Worship of the sun. Mm -hmm. So like it's, it's sun the same worship, thing. It's the same even, thing. even if it's not going to church on Sunday, at the core is the serpent, the sun, uh, the, the uh, immortality of the soul. We talked about this soul. from Ezekiel. The biggest thing is, and the biggest abomination was they were facing the sun. Yeah. And wh whether you're facing that by worshiping on its day, basically sanctifying its day, or by actually in a pagan sense, facing the sun and actually worshiping the sun. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing. It's the same system of worship. And so these really are objectively like these two pillars. Somehow the mother has tricked 
the Protestant world into thinking they're different in all these ways, and they can be, but where they matter most, they are the exact same. Just like when we looked at that Project 2025 document, they were against each other on all these things, but where yeah. it mattered most, rebuilding the third temple, getting support for Israel, mm -hmm. they were the exact same. Yeah. And so we got to see through what looks like a myriad of all of these different denominations and just cut down to the core and what you'll find at the base of it is this yeah. sun worship system and, and at the end of it, immortality of the soul. But it says it unifies almost, almost all of Christianity and paganism. Can you believe that the entire Christian world and almost all worldviews fall under the sun worship and, and immortality of the soul, but there's only three denominations on planet earth that don't. Mm -hmm. So like if people are like looking for the, the, remnant definition, those who keep the commandments yeah. of God and have the testimony of Jesus, and have these two pieces, these pillars, knowing that, well, it can't be the day of the sun, and it yeah. can't be unconditional mortality of the soul. There's only three groups. You don't actually have to look that that far. And then as we look at these three groups, we can distinguish which one is actually the one that we should be following because it has all the characteristics. Exactly. And so when you're looking at the characteristics, it's really important to get all of them because it's like you have this checklist and you have to put a check yes. next to each one. If each item doesn't hit the checklist, it can't qualify. Right. It could hit six of the 10 or mm -hmm. seven or eight or nine of the 10. If it yeah. doesn't hit all 10, it doesn't qualify. And so when you look at the last three, you've got Seventh-day Adventists, you got the Church of God Seventh Day, which oddly enough, it was a Millerite movement. So it's basically Seventh-day Adventism, but they didn't accept Ellen White's uh, prophetic writings. And then you have the Seventh-day Baptists, uh, but they're missing when it says they keep the commandments of God. So they have the seventh day. Mm -hmm. They obviously teach the commandments. But this, the, the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, yeah. understanding the 70 weeks and the 2300 days and all of the yeah. prophetic elements, who the first and second beast of Revelation 13 are. All of these are important in knowing what our job is supposed to be, which is yeah. preach the three angels' messages. But if you're not preaching prophecy, then you actually don't even qualify to be God's remnant church. You have to have these attributes in order to be known as that group. Because yeah. when we look at Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 14, and then uh, 6 to 12 is the three angels' messages. And it says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commands of God and have the faith of Jesus. And uh, it's these people who are giving these three messages and they have these criteria. Mm -hmm. So it has to have all the criteria in there. It has to have this these three messages that they're talking about. And there's only one of these groups that is talking about that. And the third angel's message is to warn people of the mark of the beast. And so like, there's all these people that are like, oh, don't bother speculating. People are saying it's all sorts of different things, but it's actually a requirement of God's remnant church yeah. to give the warning. How are you supposed to give the warning if your it church doesn't even talk about it? the message that we need it? to be giving to the world. Yes. It says, Warn the world of the mark of the beast so they don't have to receive of the plagues and the judgments that the beast will receive. But you also can't just take that one prophecy and be like, well, that's the only prophecy we need to understand. There's a whole bunch of prophecies we need to understand. Yeah. And they need to be in harmony with the Bible. They yeah. can't like go outside. Like they're not talking about computer chips. It's not talking about Elon Musk's Neuralink. Right. Like this is not what the mark of the beast is about. Yeah. And so when we look at, if we've only got three denominations left, one of them's missing prophecy, and you can't teach the mark of the beast if you don't even talk prophecy. And one of them, I would say the Church of God Seventh Day. And again, we're not against any of these groups. We're just trying to help people understand the truth. So we're not trying to say, oh, look, look at Adventism. We're just saying, let's reflect what the Bible reflects, who's doing all of these things. And I know people will say that's not true, but these this is we're trying to show our evidence-based uh case of why we think it is. Yeah. And the Church of God Seventh Day. When you look at their uh, numbers, one of the things is that you have to preach the gospel of the whole world. So part of the remnant is being small, but being large enough to spread the That's truth. That's a global movement. It has to be global. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, the Church of God Seventh Day doesn't really fit that qualification. You can't go into pretty much almost any town and and participate or find them in all parts of the world. Yeah. Um, and so there are, are more elements to that, but these are kind of the broad strokes of why... As you're picking through the details of the Bible, for me, when I was doing my due diligence, it just kept up as Adventism's doing that, Adventism's doing that, yeah. and, and it just was next after one after another. And even now, I still haven't found denominations that go as deep into understanding Bible prophecy as the Adventists uh, do, and not just saying... 
we're going to understand the mark of the beast one, but we're going to leave the 1260 days and the 1335 and the 1290. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into There's the prophetic lot. gift. Mm -hmm. But hopefully this simplifies things for people watching that there aren't really as many choices as it seems. Yes. You're really choosing either God's system or not God's system. And as we read in the Rome's challenge quotes and in future, uh, Pat, future episodes maybe that we're going to release, we reiterated those quotes that basically says in those Rome's Challenge documents that they acknowledge that the Jew and the Adventists are the only witness to the true Sabbath. And right. like that they're only almost mocking people who follow Sunday and follow the Catholic doctrine to say that it's in stark contrast yeah. to what the Adventists and the Jew already understands as this Mm -hmm. requirement by God that he reiterated over and over and that the son kept and the apostles kept. And, yeah. and so like, hopefully it's simplified down like what, what we're choosing between and that this kind of puts it end cap on this Sabbath Sunday, uh, five or six episodes we've done on this, but that somebody might be able to watch from the first episode to this last one and come out really feeling more equipped to make a good choice for themselves and for their loved ones. So again, just to recap all this, there's two main points here, Sunday sacredness and the immortality of the soul. Through the two great errors, this is great controversy 588, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. And we've already read this, but this is just to like, it is these two errors that will be the cornerstones of this final deception. And that's why we're so passionate about this and wanting to share this. And it sounds like we're a broken record yeah. because this is the two things that will make the difference. Yeah. And it's, it's you know, if you're in a burning house, the thing you need to do is get out. That, that's, that's the best thing you can do is get yeah. out of the house. Yeah. And there will be people in the comments that like really resent us for this. And that's okay. We're not asking you to believe us right now, but the fact that you sat and listened, we were grateful and we th we're thankful for, because when this starts really happening, if you've just listened to it, even if you don't like it right now, I'm hopeful that the, the Holy Spirit will produce the fruit necessary for you to see and discern what's happening in the world and make a decision for the truth, even if it's in the face of tradition and everything you've thought you've, you've normally known. And get conversant with your Bibles. It's all in there. We're not expounding anything new. And the last, just to, to reiterate here, that in Psalms, David clearly says, his breath goes forth, he returneth to the, his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Yeah. So like, again, it's not just the body, the dust part, and people say the spirit goes, you, then your spirit doesn't have any thoughts. Right. <laughs> Which then, what are you really? If you don't have the body and you don't have the thoughts, then the spirit has just gone back to God who mm -hmm. gave it. And that makes perfect sense. And to... Be very clear that, and, and I had said this in the camp meeting presentation, some people didn't like it, that the immortality we have on the other side of this is not our own immortality. Yeah. It's we, we continue to eat from the tree of life that gives us life, but that it is only one who has the, the yeah. life within them. And 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16 says it is God, the potent King of kings, potentate King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality. And so don't even think that when we have the immortality, that it is our immortality. Yeah. It really is God's. He is the only one, and we are partaking in his immortality through his son, who's who's worthy to receive it. And yeah. we're able to, to, as it says, meet at the river and eat at the tree of life and the leaves of the healing of nations. And this is what we get to partake in as a blessing. But even at the end, it's not our own. It's, it's Christ. So Mackenzie, another episode has come to an end. And I think, as you said, we've kind of really give it our best with this Sunday Sabbath issue to show people why we think the truth is what it is. And hopefully people, even if they don't agree, have found value in it. And people, if they do, they have more ammunition than ever to go share and give uh, evidence-based support for why we believe so fervently on this issue and why we hope that people will come around and, and understand as we do. And even if people right now don't uh, understand or, or agree or they're not there yet, keep in mind what we're saying because we really do believe this is going to happen. And then when you see it happen, you can see, oh, wow, these guys were right. And it's not that we're right. The Bible was right. We're just trying to share 
the truth exactly. that the Bible is trying to give to all of us so that we all don't have to be deceived. There will be a time, and it's coming very soon, when America will be doing miracles. They'll be raising, there will be dead people being raised, whether it's apostles or, you know, important people being raised saying, God has changed the day. We need to go back to Sunday. This is the way to get God back in the country. This is what we have to do. When people see that taking place, then they can judge. Is that, was this truth or was this not? Yeah. And let's say, even if we were totally wrong, everything we're doing, we're trying to use the Bible and do it with love. And so uh, I hope that people can appreciate that uh, we're doing this uh, out of a hope that we're not special, that we're all special together in Christ and that there isn't a Jew and Gentile. There's God's children and not God's children. Yeah. And we want everyone who chooses to be God's children. Yeah. And if this can help, even if we were wrong, if this could help somebody. But uh, I think that we've done a pretty good job of showing why the Bible evidence and the, the whole suite of evidence uh, heavily suggests that what we're saying is true. And now we're saying, we're kind of putting our money where our mouth is and saying, let's see what happens in the future. Let's yeah. see what happens in those Protestant churches. But in the meantime, uh, if you guys find this type of content valuable, if you want to continue uh, helping us get more of this put together with the little time we have, we are 100% donation-based ministry. And uh, we don't ask for anything in particular other than whatever the Holy Spirit puts on your heart to give. But the more that we do this, the more we're seeing how it's impacting people and the amount of people it's yeah. reaching, that we just want to continue as long as we can. And if uh, if you feel compelled to, to help and support that, it directly goes into uh, reaching new people for Christ. Yes. And please go to adtv.watch because if we're removed from YouTube, then that's where you find us and uh, you can make a login. Go to the resources below and then all the things that we talked about today, the quotes, the Bible verses, you can relook and study those things for yourself, which is what we're trying to compel people to do. Yeah. Get in your Bibles, get studied, because that's the only thing going to keep you from being deceived, not listening to any person or ideology from any church, denomination, ministry, but getting in your Bibles and understanding it for yourself and being able to give that answer. So thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next Truth Matters.